look at your sheet. The opposite side. Oh, okay, okay. I thought I had a different piece on here. You know what? I was going to do the top one, and that's kind of cool. But when when box this doubles, you see at the bottom of that sheet, there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a partita number one and B number one. He's got a double. So here's an Alamondo, which is a German dance. Then he's got a double to go with it. And there's a relationship between them. When he does a double, he's taking the same chords and he's realizing them in a different way. <coughs> Very cool. So see if you can see some connections between these two. Why don't you do this? That's going to look kind of crazy, but when you've got some melody notes going on, I don't know where they are, but if you say, oh, that's a, that belongs to some upper part, and maybe this is my bass, why don't you use stems? And just try and find some main melody notes that you think, you know, if you were to sort of take this music and create a crown-like texture out of it, that this would be your soprano note, stem note. You squish all this note stuff that's arpeggiated together and go, oh, that's the lowest note in the chord, that's my bass. Put a stem down. You see what we're doing? Mm -hmm. So, not on a separate sheet, but right on the score, for every chord, assign one note with an upward stem and one note with a downward stem. As best you can. Now, it's going to be approximate, that's okay. But try it out, see what you think. Would this be the main one or the double? Or so do it for the alamada and, and the double at the same time and see if you can see okay. some so relationships. Each beat. Well, you got to decide where the chord changes are, and you, you can use the main bass notes again to sort of guide you. So as a first approximation, I might go, um, I see a B, A sharp, back to B in the bass, 1 sub 1 in B minor. Do you see that in the alamada? Yeah. That's probably, those are probably bass notes right there. That's probably a bass line. And then the harmonic rhythm looks like it picks up a little bit. And then in the double, see if you can get a match with that. Can you get the same bass line? In other words, is it truly a double, just with a completely different style to it? Try it out.
some of the main melody notes come in. So, soprano-wise, I would stem that pickup note upward. And then there's a motion from that F sharp up to a B within the first beat in the first one and in the second. That matches. Right after it, there's a G in both. They match. It keeps going for quite a while, doesn't it? Where they're, they're matching notes. So what's the soprano line do, basically? Five. Yes, there's a one, but then six. So five, six, five. Do you, are you with me there? And they both do that, don't they? Five, six, five. It takes a while for the five to arrive the second time. Mm -hmm. Maybe even there's a suspension there. You follow me on that? Yeah. So an A sharp shows up in the bass in each. But look at the second one in the double. The G takes a while to resolve. It's still hanging out there and then arrives. That's in the double. Look at the third beat in. A sharp's in the bass. Mm -hmm. The G's still there and then it comes down to the F sharp. Okay. <clears throat> then the next chord is going to be a another B minor because we've got to take that 5, 6, 5 and resolve it. That's the chord above the, the A sharp. So 5, 6, 5 has got to resolve. It gets to the 1 in each case. See where the A sharp resolves in the Alamanda? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then immediately there's a passing chord right after it, so it's fleeting. The upper note there is B in the first and in the double as well. Cool. They match again. Bass note, B. Upper note, D. Neat. And then that passing tone in the bass in the Alamanda. It's an A natural now because he's going to go down. But the bass line is going to descend. B, A, and then G. It's hard to say exactly how that's harmonized, but the double sort of clarifies, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear what chord there. Put those notes together and you probably got I would I would assume that it'd be a B chord with the A coming in as a seventh. That's mm -hmm. that'd be my impression. It's, I'm taking that, you know, I'm sort of it's debatable. I'm going out on a limb to say that, but probably that's a chordal seventh. And it shows up again in the double, the A natural getting down to the G. That's really kind of cool that you got the same basic no. chords going on, and he's pulling out of them very different melodies. Eric? Why would you not look at the A and the F sharp as a, as a D second uh, second version? You could. That would you could, just that work. Okay. That would work. Okay. Yeah. Going, going to the, the G, the dominant. Uh, well, would, G, would, G would be the dominant. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's not the dominant. No. But is it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a six. It's a seven. I was right. Could be wrong writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm not going to have time to really go with that because we're out of time right now. 
But that is kind of neat where you can see that, I mean, it's for one instrument. And yes, yeah, sometimes he presents them as chords, but in the second one, there's not ever a time where they're two notes sounding together. In other words, it's all compound melody. He's taking the chords and he's moving through them in artful ways to create a very intricate compound melody. That's pretty much an, that's an extreme example of compound melody. But today we're really looking at the interaction between melody and harmony and how they're really inseparable. They're, they're working hand in glove. And in the phrase model you see it because scale degree is really derived in it. In counterpoint, the melodies are elaborating the harmony because they're delaying resolution a lot of the time. And then with compound melody, you can see there's a ba there's basic harmonic stuff. The basic material, are, are, yeah, they form harmonies, but by pulling out specific notes from those harmonies, you get these melodies. You're drawing from harmonic resources to create your melody in the first place. So it's like those chicken egg and egg questions. You know, which comes first, the harmony or the melody? I don't know. You know, they're they're working together so tightly that you can't really make a case one way or the other for that. Anyway, so uh, look online. Our next thing will be two reading assignments. One of them is about what is a phrase, <laughs> okay? Then the other one is the beginning of our first main topic. If you look down the topics in the syllabus, the first thing is going to be Shankarian to me, which we're going to do first because it helps us define what a phrase is, and it also shows the relationship between harmony and melody in a, in a very specific kind of way. And counterpoint, it will bring them all together. So this is all the silence here? That's right, yeah. So if you look at this, at, at uh, Moodle, Right at the top, you'll see assignment number one for this week. Uh, that'll give you the direction. The two readings are right underneath it. And then some analytical stuff. So, Roger. five. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Shanker's conception of musical structure. But these are all, these three are going to line up. These three examples are going to line up with these three topics. So, kind of like what we did today, we had an example that allowed you to look at a phrase model one that allowed you to do counterpoint, those are going to do the same thing. Just by yourself and let me see if you've really got it. Okay? All right, so <clears throat> it's a long time from now, until <laughs> Thursday next. Mm -hmm. If you have questions, just email me or give me a call. Okay? Mm -hmm. And they'll probably come up. So